Good morning. Uh, my name is Rajan Gloria and I'm the director of education at Ragdale. You just viewed Imagine Working the Land, a recent piece produced and performed by today's creative POV artist, former and puppeteer, Sam Lewis. Born in rural Tennessee and raised in St. Louis, Sam moved to Chicago to attend Columbia College in 1995, 
Four years later, he became a founding member and director of the Elastic Arts Foundation. Since that time, Sam has worked to enrich the tremendous art scene in the city. He created and curates the Hip Hop and Dark Matter series at Elastic and was a founder of the Logan Square Arts Festival and A Day in Avondale. He's performed in several puppetry festivals, held workshops for Chicago public school students, and worked as a teaching resident with Elastic and Red Moon Theater Company. He currently sits on the board of directors of Elastic Arts and I Am Logan Square and was a founder and board member of the Logan Square Chamber of Arts. And Sam is part of Ragdale staff as the director of communications. Returning to interview, Sam is Margaret Hawkins, who's the author of three novels, Lydia's Party, A Year of Cats and Dogs and How to Survive a Natural Disaster, and a memoir about her sister after schizophrenia, the story of my sister's reawakening. She writes about art for BAS and is currently a senior lecturer at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and just finished teaching for Ragdale's High School Arts Intensive for Ragdale for I think the 12th or 13th time now. Sam and Margaret, thank you both for being here. Sam, you're always here so I'm running the Creative POV series, so I'm pleased you're being featured this time. Uh, Margaret, yeah. I turn it over to you. What? I think oh. you're muted, Margaret. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Can you hear me now? Great. Uh, thank you, Regin, and thank you, um, everyone, for showing up here to listen to Sam talk about his very interesting art practice. So I'd like to start with that, Sam. Um, I think of you as a puppet artist because when I met you, that's what um, that's what you were doing. But I also know that you have this, um, you know, c art career behind you already. Um, that you're an actor, a writer, a musician, uh, a composer, and a singer. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about um, how your art practice developed and how you came to be doing the work you are doing now? Uh, right up to now with this wonderful video we just saw. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's it's good to be on this side of, of the fence with this whole thing. Uh, I've enjoyed um, watching the POV series and these other um, remote series that Ragdale has been doing. So it's good to be a focus of one. So thank you. Um, yeah, I started by, um, I was always interested in the arts, but um, when my best friend transferred to a performing arts school in fifth grade, um, I followed him because I was, because he was my best friend and then ended up loving the school that I attended. And that's where my kind of acting education started in earnest and went through high school doing that. It was very similar to like a fame type situation. So, you know, a lot of dancing in the hallways and principals who were concert pianists and things like that. So that gave me a really good foundation um, to build from. And I thought I wanted to be on Broadway and everything, but St. Louis being a music town, music kind of really swayed me. And I started getting into spoken word poetry and hip hop and, and things like that. When I moved to Chicago in 95 to attend Columbia, um, I ended up getting into a, um, a, a play, The Sirens of Titan, uh, uh, David Cromer, uh, MacArthur Genius Awardee, um, was the director. And that was a really cool experience for me and kind of got me involved in the Chicago theater scene a bit. But uh, shortly after that, I got with some some guys, a lot of people who went to Northwestern and formed Elastic Arts in the late 90s and performed and arts organized and did that whole thing ever since then. And it's really 15 years ago is when I started getting into puppetry where I just came across a, a vintage marionette that my father-in-law owned and was really struck by this Black Americana figure and after watching the movie Bamboozled, not too long before I came across this puppet, it really inspired me to kind of work with that iconography and kind of reinterpret it from um, a black male perspective and really had a lot of interesting moments to say the least working with that, um, especially as it started getting closer to 2016 and how the racial climate really changed drastically um, more overtly with a lot of things and it, 
had a new relevance um, after that point. And so I, I call myself an accidental puppeteer, but I'm trying to be kind of really intentional with the work that I'm doing now. Um, and it's now morphed yet again to kind of working with puppets that I am having a major hand in creating with the help of people like Grace Needleman. So that's where my work is today. And it's very more autobiographical and um, dealing with specific family history. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, this work you're doing is so timely. Um, and that puppet that you, that, you know, like blackface racial stereotype puppet that you found in your, in your um, uh, father-in-law's collection is so, um, you know, it, it is so painfully timely in terms of its being like wildly um, out of sync with any kind of perspective or empathy or idea about accepting people, um, accepting people. So can you talk a little bit about how you, um, you know, what that means? Did you intend to be making a statement about race and racial identity all along in your work? Or is that something that really got sparked by this object that you began to work with? Yeah, it's, it's really, it was sparked by that because uh, my work has always been somewhat autobiographical. I feel like that those are the best stories, the stories that are closest to you that you know the best. But when I came across that marionette, I was like, you know, I'm very attuned to negative stereotypes of people in general, but definitely of African Americans in advertising and just in media. And I know that there was that time where it was like extremely overt and, you know, things that we're still kind of dealing with the ramifications of that today. But when I came across this puppet, which under the standards of that kind of iconography, it's milder, I should say, <laughs> to a certain extent, um, but still offensive. And I wanted to just kind of get it out there and just showing people just if you walk out on stage and you have that puppet and if you just stood there for five minutes that would be a lesson in and of itself to just know that something like that was manufactured created and mass produced and sent out to kids all across this country um, in the late 40s um, but then trying to give that imagery a personality um, and a personality that is powerful in a lot of ways um, was something that was really important to me. And then also there's a lot of, you know, de-emphasizing of the puppeteer and puppetry where you're like, keep the focus on the puppet. I wanted people to kind of be conscious of seeing me operating the puppet. And yeah. I think that visual um, is really powerful as well. Right, that's such an edgy approach. It's like turning puppetry on its ear, you know, turning it upside down and then saying it's about the puppet, but it's about the puppeteer. And what does this mean that a puppet like this was made? Um, uh, what is it about? This is a little detour, but this is so interesting to me because you, you know, you have all these talents and all these multiple disciplines within which you work, but what is it about puppetry? What's, what's with puppets? Why are they so appealing and why will people respond to them in a way that they won't with real, with real actors? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, puppets are real actors. No, <laughs> but no, um, it's just a great storytelling vehicle, you know, and it's, it's like uh, as close as we can get in real life to animation, I feel, um, because you can do whatever. You can break physics. You can tell these stories. You can fly. You can move mountains. You can do all of this stuff. Um, telling these stories. And I think there's just something, I don't know what it is inside of us that really tunes in when we see um, stories being told by puppets. Maybe it's our, you know, for those of a certain age, our upbringing with things like Sesame Street and so forth. Um, that was always a huge impact on me. And I think more people, you know, people, I tell people I do puppetry. I told one of my friends and he was like, puppets, <laughs> puppetry. <laughs> puppets like he just kept repeating that and i was like what is so crazy about that you grew up watching sesame street it's like something just totally normal i think um 
in people's psyche and it's a mainstream concept, but I think people feel like maybe it's just for children. Um, but I feel like it's not just for children. And I feel like a lot of the work that's being done today is, has definitely um, appealed to adults and to older people and people of all ages really. And so um, I find it just the perfect way to tell a story. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Rogers said something about how people will say things to a puppet that they wouldn't say to him or to another human being. That was a really an interesting observation. Um, you, you, let's see, this is kind of a, this is sort of a link question. One is, you said to me when we talked on Monday, you said that puppetry is very white, that that is, you know, predominantly, the puppet artists are predominantly white. And so you were sort of interesting, interested in, in um, you know, kind of infiltrating that or, you know, sort of seizing that. Um, for your own stories, um, and also kind of linked to that, I wanted to ask you again what I asked you before, which is what artists are your, you know, are your inf in inspiration and influencers? And I know you said there, you know, there isn't just one, there's too many. I would never want to insult one by picking another, but just give me the, you know, there's a, quite a list. I wrote them down if, if you can't remember. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've since thought about that question, but um, yeah, I feel like puppetry as a whole is generally um, um, not something that people of color are by and large interested in, although that's changing drastically and by the day and every time, you know, there was recently a grant, um, a black puppeteer grant from an organization that was in Massachusetts. And, and I was wondering like, how many people are applying? How many, like what's going on? And then when they announced the winners, unfortunately I wasn't one of them, but when they announced the winners, um, there were six puppeteers. I hadn't heard of any of them and they were all doing really great work and very accomplished. And so it gave me a lot of hope um, on a larger scope because you know a lot of my experience has been with the, the local Chicago scene. And there, a lot of the puppeteers in the scene are extremely open and want to be more inclusive um, of other voices in the medium. And I think it's just not something that a lot of African-Americans have been told like, hey, this exists and this is a great way to tell a story. And I think as they become more aware of it, I think you're gonna see a lot more people of color like taking part in the medium. And I think it's only going to, to do um, a service to it as a whole. But, um, you know, I have a lot of influences across a lot of disciplines and genres, but as far as puppetry is concerned, um, there's a, a puppeteer named Jaghetto uh, who's based in North Carolina who does amazing work. Um, he's an amazing builder as well as storyteller. And I would say that he's probably my single biggest influence as far as puppetry is concerned. I mean, he's the reason why I'm working with Rod Puppets from the beginning because I was uh, had the the pleasure of sharing a bill with him at the last uh, Chicago International Puppet Theater Festival, and he did a really powerful piece called Just Another Lynching, and he used Rod Puppets to tell that story, and I was like, that's it, you know, because I had been looking for a way to kind of um, get deeper into the puppetry scene because I was working with this marionette that was manufactured where in the scene in general, there's, it's almost as much of emphasis on building as it is on actual puppeteering. And so I really felt kind of bad on the download of like, that I was working with this manufactured puppet and pretty much everyone else is working with something that they've built or had built um, specifically for them. And so I was looking to kind of expand my horizons in that area. And once I saw him dealing with these rod puppets, I was like, that's it, you know, they have so much life and I love that it takes more than usually more than one person to manipulate it. So it's like this group effort. And so, and he was using, working with his son um, as well as other people using this. And so I kind of was majorly influenced by that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm working with my two sons with um, this puppet that you see over my shoulder here right now. So yeah, I would, I would count him as a big time influence. Cool. Cool. Um, I uh, since you pointed to your grandfather there, your, your grandfather's in, in effigy, in puppet effigy, um, could you um, could you tell us about him, about how about how you made him, how you dressed him, how you got the portrait face? I mean, he's so 
like he, he just feels like a person, like a real, you know, presence in your home there. So tell us about him. Yeah. So it all leads back to um, 2019, really kind of late 2018, when I started trying to find out more information about my father's side of the family. And so I started doing like an ancestry DNA test and got my results back. And then I started just asking questions because um, I'm, my parents separated when I was very young. And that's why I left Tennessee and grew up in St. Louis. But um, and so I didn't really know that much about my father's side of the family, but I felt a really strong connection to that side. And I felt like there was something there that I was just missing. And, and I thought that I would never find out what that was. And so through the process of asking questions to a bunch of people, I ended up coming into contact with this man who is a descendant of people that enslaved both sides of my father's side of the family for well over a hundred years. And he also happened to be a historian who had written a couple of books, self-published books. And um, I became friends with him and he started sharing all of this information. It's kind of weird where you come in contact with a white guy and he knows more about your family and your history than you do. And it was mind blowing and I'm kind of still processing that uh, in a lot of ways. And so that really kind of, you know, prompted me to try to tell this story via puppetry. And then I was like, well, what puppet? Because there's so many characters in that story. And so I, I thought I would start with my grandfather, who um, when I was born, I was brought into his home in West Tennessee. And so I do have that physical connection to him, but he died shortly after I was born. And so I never really got a chance to really know him. Uh, Although my mom always tells a story about how uh, I was a, you know, must have been two or maybe even three. And I ran up to her and I said, Mom, Grandpa says those pigs are getting out. Those bastards, those bastards. And it's like he, he was like saying that. And and I knew that I shouldn't have been saying that. And she always laughs about that story about how I was like, I'm just quoting, you know, I'm just <laughs> quoting what he said, you know. And so that really means so much to me now to know that. I spoke his words and that's really the only words. And I, I don't remember hearing those words, but it was really powerful to me. And so I thought I would start by creating a puppet representation of him um, because I was really fascinated by his life um, being a blacksmith and living in the center of this town and having white clientele and black clientele um, and just how he lived his life. I was super inspired by. So I thought it was a great way to start telling this story. Yeah, yeah. In what um, in what generational point did it, it, it? What ancestor of yours was um, enslaved and then freed? So his mother and father. Wow. And both of my grandparents' parents were uh, born into slavery. That is so um, close. Yeah, I know. It's like so close, and you know the the crazy thing is. That house is so powerful to me, the house that was his house that he got this land during like the height of Jim Crow in like 1915 and was able to build this brick house in the middle of town um, and have his shop next door. Um, he had his grandfather staying with him at, at one point who he was definitely a slave for the vast majority of his life. Um, and so, I was in that house too. And so that's just like right there, you know, and it's, you, you think of slavery as being this thing that was so, so long ago, but it really was not long ago at all in that, in that sense. Wow. Wow. Um, so much of your work has to do with family um, and the new, newest work, I think. And you say that you now have this puppet troupe, that includes your sons who yeah. helped to man the puppet because this is a, you know, this is a collaborative art form and, you know, the, all the body parts need to be moved with the rods. Um, I was wondering how that works. Do they, do they, um, like, are they artists and they want to be artists or are they like, okay, dad, now, are we done now? Can I go <laughs> do something else? A little bit of both. Well, you know, uh, my youngest son um, has been, um, taking piano for a little over a year now, and he really likes that. Um, but they're mostly like, 
you know, tech, tech geeks um, in a large sense. Um, but um, they were hesitant and I really kind of like, come on, I want you guys to do this thing. And one of the things that got them was, I'll pay you, you know? And so we've, I've had like a bunch of, of paid gigs um, since the quarantine. And really the quarantine was really one of the, the, the things that helped a lot because I'm doing shows at my house or we're recording a video at our house or at Elastic. And so it's not like I'm taking them to um, a venue at seven, eight o'clock and we're staying there till 10 and there's all that stuff wrapped around with that. And so they don't have to do that to kind of go out to do it. And so the combination of being close to home and then getting paid, <laughs> they love that getting paid part. Uh, and I tell them, I'm like, you're a professional puppeteer. You got yeah, yeah. paying you money, you know? And they're like, yeah, yeah get me an adapter, job. give me that cable. <laughs> you know, they, they spend their money on the craziest adapters and things. But I thought it was a great, you know, I thought it was a, the best way possible to salvage this summer because obviously we weren't able to do a lot of the things that we normally like to do, like go to the beach, go on vacations and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah no, it's great. I mean, to form a puppet troupe during the quarantine is like a gift in a way. Um, you, you know, talking about your sons and your son playing piano and they're both working with you. And I know your other son, I think he's the one who helps you, his works with you on a radio broadcast. I think you yes. the show. So there's all this art in your family. Um, what about you as a child? You said you went to the art school when you were in fifth grade following your buddy. Um, did, did you, were you an artist? Were you just a born artist or did you decide to become one? And connected to that question, do you have some like aesthetic memory that was kind of life changing? Because I think a lot of artists do, but. but. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm a Libra and, you know, maybe people agree uh, and follow astrology or don't, but I just feel like I have a, a, an inclination to the arts and I've always just been kind of a dramatic person <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, when, when I went to the performing arts school and then my friend was there and then he decided he wanted to then go to um, a gifted school instead. And I was like, okay, see ya. You know, like I was through following him after that because once I got to that school, it was kind of like, if that was the only reason for our friendship that was like one of the best things he could have ever done was to kind of lead me to that school because that's where I really found my home and found amazing instructors. And, you know, um, you know, like I said, I was born in West Tennessee and my family in St. Louis likes to joke that when, when I came up from Tennessee, I was like, I had a very country accent. Uh, but then going to this performing arts school, I was sitting and listening to headphones and doing, you know, unique New York and all this diction training and all this stuff. And at the time I was like, what does this have to do with acting at all, you know? And now, you know, I'm, I've been in points where I made like $200 an hour doing voice work and I'm like, thank you, you know, <laughs> I appreciate it. And so, you know, that was all, all wrapped up. But, you know, I just, I don't know what it is, but it's like, when I'm performing and when I'm exposed to that is when I'm at like the most peace. And so I think I quickly discovered that uh, early on in like fifth or sixth grade. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And, you know, back in the days when we had um, the encyclopedias that you had to buy, the set, yeah. you know, like wear out the New York uh, encyclopedia, you know, like looking at New York and looking at Greenwich Village and like studying New York. I'm like, I'm going to be on Broadway. I'm going to live in New York and I'm going to do this stuff. And I was like, that's what I did for fun in like seventh grade. Just like, look at that stuff, you know? So you were kind of stamped from birth with this nature, I guess. Um, what, this kind of reminds me of something else. What do you like, you know, what is it about being an artist that you love? You know, there's that feeling. And I think one of the tough things with the quarantine is that you don't get the audience feedback you know, it's not just the applause, which is great, but just when people are like, oh, you know, like those gasps and oh, those little laughs that yeah. you hear when you're performing. And even if you're not like looking at them, you feel that energy 
And I think that's been one of the toughest things to overcome trying to perform in a virtual setting. Um, and that's why I kind of am a huge fan of like the chat, you know, and if, if you can, while you're performing somehow be conscious of the chat to see where people's heads are, I think it helps because, you know, you stop and you hear nothing, you know, it's the silence, you know, especially if you're trying to tell jokes or do something that should elicit a laughter, laugh or something like that. It's really, it's tough. Um, but I love that, the, the crowd reaction. And then I also just love the kind of, the way the arts kind of prompts you to a greater depth of thought and just exploring your own emotions and your own feelings and kind of making sense of the world, which at times can feel pretty chaotic, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, so many questions I have for you. Um, what I know you work full time at Ragdale now, and you do about a dozen other things also. When you're working on a project, on a on a, you know, for instance, the video with the with the grandfather puppet working the land, what is your work day like? How does that, you know, when you don't have to come to Ragdale and sit behind a desk, what do you do? I mean, do you get up at five in the morning and start working? Or do you read for a while? Or how do, how do you organize your creative time? Yeah, lately I've been waking up early and like going on a bike ride, like a 20 mile bike ride, which like <laughs> kind of clears all the cobwebs out and I get to like see the lake and like kind of, I just feel like riding a bike and just is really meditative in a lot of ways. And it allows me to kind of think and um, kind of recenter myself. And so I like to get that out of the way and that really helps propel the rest of my day. But when I created that video that was just shown earlier, it was on the 4th of July and it was like super hot. And, you know, this was, and maybe a lot of other uh, black people especially can kind of um, understand, but I, you know, I've always been proud to be an American and be from this country. And while there feel like there's a lot of things that need to be changed and need to be changed urgently, I feel like I am a stakeholder in this experience and I'm not going to just give up and leave as people always try to encourage us to do if we disagree. But, um, and once I found out that I have definite history in this land since, you know, before it was a country and at least to the mid 1700s, then I was even more of a stakeholder. And so I will celebrate um, usually the 4th of July with, an asterisk usually, but this time I woke up and I honestly had forgotten it was the 4th of July. And I was just like, oh, and I was like, oh, it's the 4th of July. Like it like didn't hit me, especially cause I was really like um, celebratory on Juneteenth um, this year. And I felt like I kind of got that kind of thing out of my system then. And so I woke up and I was like, well, what am I gonna do today? And I really didn't feel like doing the stereotypical like I don't eat meat, so like barbecuing and all that kind of stuff is not necessarily my thing. Um, and it was super hot that day, if you remember. So I was like, let's do the video, you know? Let's just do it. And so we got out and that's how we spent our 4th of July was doing that video. And, you know, I have a lot of technical expertise like working with videos. And so one of the huge priorities of mine was to kind of control a lot of the means of production because I wanted to not only be able to be a performer, but also know the technical aspect of what it takes to put on a production. So I feel like I can do a lot of that stuff myself and it really helps um, get my vision out in a lot more streamlined fashion and I don't have to depend on um, a lot of other folks to get that done. And so that, that really helps during a quarantine time when you know you aren't able to get videographers and other folks to come over really easily to work with you so um i use my you know had my wife help on being a videographer and my sons were doing the puppetry with me so i did the music and so it was a completely family affair but you know i work i don't have like a set way that i like to work i like to work um whenever the mood hits me. And I think that was one of the reasons why I kind of put down puppetry for a number of years because I just didn't feel the urge. I didn't feel that inner motivation to do it. And if I don't feel that, then I don't know, I can't force myself to create work, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, 
So you made that all in one day? Oh, yes. I made it, edited it, and was ready to go all on the 4th of July. <laughs> Have you already written the song or and performed it? Yeah, you know, that's funny. Um, I made the song so... I've been, you know, again, quarantine. A lot of this stuff is rooted out of the quarantine, but um, a lot of my friends are like really more um, thoroughly developing their home studios and stuff. And so this, my one of my best friends who's like a brother to me, he's like developing his stuff and he was using GarageBand and he was like making beats and stuff. He's a multi-instrumentalist, but he was like making beats. And I was like, man, I want you to make some beats for me. I want to do some more rapping and get on these tracks, be a 50 year old rapper, you know? Um, and he was like, man, He's like, dude, you can make your own tracks. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, you know, he's like, let me show you something. And he, sh he said, go here, look at this. You got some loops here, you got some. I swear I made that song in like 10 minutes. And, and then I kind of just arranged it. And I was like, oh, it's over now. It's all over. I'm like, <laughs> don't give me some information because I'm going to like use it, you know, to the fullest. And so um, now I'm like, all about I'm a producer now and I'll make yeah. a beat and, and I produced this song uh, for Marvin Tate who's one of my really good friends and a really great um, um, artist singer painter everything so I made a song for him and we recorded it called Emancipation Blues which Regin wanted to play the video for that to start this thing out which I think is is an awesome track as well and so yeah you know um that was easy. The whole project was like really easy. And I love it when it, when it works out like that. Um, you know, sometimes I get afraid of like getting blocked um, with the creative process. And so when it's like flowing, which for some reason it is right now, and I know that's not the case for all artists. I mean, I think some people are like otherwise um, engaged in things that are, you know, may seem more relevant and important, but I, I think that, being creative right now and expressing that is helpful for the artists, but also for the people who are engaging with your art um, to help them get through these unprecedented times. So I've been feeling really good in that sense. Absolutely. It's a gift to, to all of us, the community of artists. Um, I, Regin has appeared here in my, in my peripheral vision, which makes me know that we are coming to the next segment. So I want to ask you my one last question. And it is this, I warned you. So he, he's, he, I think he has a ready answer, but maybe you've changed your mind. Um, uh, if you could give one piece of advice to young or emerging artists, what would it be? I would say to be yourself and to find your voice. Because I think a lot of people, and rightfully so, come into the arts being inspired by someone. You know, if you, if you play the trumpet, it's hard not to be inspired by Miles Davis or you know, or Toro Sandoval or somebody like that. But, and you may kind of mimic them in the nicest possible way initially, but I think you need to find how are you coming to express yourself through the trumpet or whatever medium you're using and then go with that. Because people, you know, art is subjective and people can say this or that about your work, but it's hard to criticize work that's coming from a true place and coming from a real place. And they may not feel it great, but it's hard to criticize work that's coming from that direction. And so I would just recommend that everyone kind of look inside. Like I, I always say one of my favorite quotes is listen from the inside out. And so you listen to that inner self and then turn that around and then project that out to the world. And I think you'd be just fine. <laughs> That's great advice. It's great advice for young people who are listening to this. Thank you, Sam. Um, Regin, did you? Yeah. So if you don't mind, we actually have a question from the audience from Rebecca, a fellow resident alum. Um, okay. and she wants to, hi Rebecca, thanks for coming to the, the program. Uh, she wants to know if you could uh, tell us more about your choice to draw attention to the puppeteer uh, in your performances. Yeah, absolutely. Because I feel like people of color and black people in particular are often powerless. And when, you know, people always talk about that term of like, they're the puppet master, they're the puppet master, you're controlling things. And there's this, you know, the man is controlling things, you know, with every 
with everyone. And, and I'm like, in this case, I'm the, the master, I'm the controller, I'm the one pulling the strings and making things happen. But in a just way, in an equitable way, in a progressive way. And so I think it's important for people to see that and just to know that we have maybe more power and I think we can take and accept power without having to necessarily be given power. Um, it's already there within us and look, I'm an example of that. And so that's why I wanted to kind of put the focus as much on me as the puppet as well, is you see this whole package. And I thought that was really important because I didn't always feel that way. I, I wanted to kind of de-emphasize myself. And, you know, we always like puppeteers often wear black and to kind of minimize their appearance. But, you know, I wanted to be out there and let people see this, especially now with my sons working with this as well. I, you know, I posted a picture of the three of us um, manipulating the puppet and, it just blew up like people love just seeing that, um, seeing the connection of multiple generations um, working together, black men working together, um, a tight family structure working together, being a black father, working with your kids. It's like, it's just so many levels of that. I feel like it's important for people to see that. And we need to see as many examples of that as we can. I just wanna be one, one, one more of those. Very well said, Sam. Did your sons have anything um, to say specifically after that kind of went out into the world? Or are they sort of far removed from it in their social circles? I'm just curious. Well, they don't, like, my oldest son is, um, he's, uh, he considers himself a socialist and he's pretty much, um, he's a 15 year old socialist that, um, wants doesn't want his image anywhere on the internet um and so it's hard for him in some ways you know because i try to take a picture of him he's like no no you know and so just the fact that he's getting out there and doing something uh i think is great but then my younger son um he's like got like hundred thousand followers on TikTok or something like crazy, you know? Um, and so he's like on the other end of the spectrum and I think he's a lot more social, um, but they, they're finding their ways to deal with it. I don't think they're interested in, and I understand to a certain degree, but they're not really interested in going back and watching the videos and looking at the performances. It's like once they do it, they're done with it and they're on to something else, you know? Mark, I want to turn it back over to you if you wanted to, if there was any final things that you wanted to ask Sam, oh. Sam if you wanted to close it out. Anything. Yeah. Um, well, very briefly, tell us about um, your grandfather in his um, daishiki who's sitting behind you. Um, what is, what's next for him? And that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I set out with this whole thing once I, started finding out all of this information about my family history, I really wanted to kind of tell it as this one. I always like, it's an hour long puppet theater piece that's telling this story. And I don't know if that's how I'm exactly thinking about it anymore. I think I'm just going where the motivation takes me and I'm like creating pieces that's going to maybe as a mosaic kind of try to encapsulate this story. I mean, I may right? I may write a book about it. I may do a, a long, full-length puppetry piece. I may do a, just a straight theater piece. I don't know how it's all going to um, to pan out. I'm just going where the, the motivation takes me right now. But I really have been feeling these short video pieces that focus a lot on on ritual and on like a lot of imagery where you can use your imagination rather than flooding you with a bunch of words. And so that's kind of where I am right now. Yeah. Yeah. I can really see the, um, the seed of that in the imagine working the land piece, the title, by the way, I love, I love, love the introduction of the word imagine. It's like inviting you to engage with it in a certain way. That's great. I, yeah. I, I think we have spent our time a little bit over. Thank you so much, Sam, for this. Um, no problem. But I did want to say real quick that I, you know, as far as working the land, I feel like it's super important. I know that we're like going deep into this digital realm and I love that personally. That's kind of 
in my nature, but also I've also felt an even deeper connection to nature. And I feel like that's another reason why I really like that video is because I want to prompt people to start their own home gardens. I feel like it's very necessary, not just for fresh local food, but as a hedge against food insecurity, you know, um, I think it's super important and just being with nature. I haven't seen so many people walking in my neighborhood, biking, um, doing things like reconnecting um, with nature than ever. And I think that's at least a, one positive thing that's come out of this pandemic. So I wanted the video to speak to that as well. Yeah, with the eating of the raspberries. Oh yeah, those raspberries are so good. <laughs> and black, black raspberries, those. Mm. We had a bumper crop this year. I don't know if anyone else has raspberries, but I, we had personally a bumper crop. Beautiful. Reggie? Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sam and Margaret. And thank you to everyone for your time and attention. I hope you enjoyed today's Creative POV Artist Talk. As you all know, this has been recorded and will be available for viewing on Ragdale's website and our YouTube channel very soon. We actually have an entire playlist of all of our previous uh, Creative POV video series. Um, and along with those, we'll be having uh, educator guides that will be available in a PDF format. So follow Sam on Twitter at SamIM313 and Margaret's work at MargaretHawkins.com. Check out all the upcoming events on Ragdale's website, ragdale.org. Uh, next Creative POV Artist Talk will be August 17th with audio producer and filmmaker Sharon Mashihi. And we'll be uh, having our Ragdale Ring performance. Uh, Sam, you can tell me, I think it's being aired on August 12th, is that correct? Well, we're going to do a live version, but it's like a private event on the 12th. But then I'm going to um, do a live stream kind of rebroadcast that's going to be edited in an amazing way um, on the 19th. So I think that's the one that you probably want to check out, August 19th, and details to follow on that. Exactly. And also... with Milky and all kinds of great um, Japanese music, dance, and culture with a little jazz thrown in. If you know Tatsu, you know, there's gonna be some jazz thrown into that as well. Excited about that. Thanks, Sam. And of course, don't forget uh, all of the work from the high school arts intensive that Margaret worked so hard with the students on will be aired on August 16th. That's a Sunday at 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.